this is Charlie Montatuyella with Blue Bear Flutes. Of course, our website, bluebearflutes.com, here on YouTube under Blue Bear Flutes. And if you think about it, chances are you can find us under Blue Bear Flutes just about anywhere else, at least Instagram and Facebook. And on the occasional Twitter post, we'll have one there under Blue Bear Flutes. And uh, Pinterest, and whew, gosh, I know there's something I'm missing. But anyway, we're there. So, uh, and by the way, if you hadn't had a chance to check out our Instagram, please make sure you take a look at it. If you're one of those people who doesn't look at Instagram, it's okay. You can actually look at it through the website to some degree. And then once you see, oh my gosh, look at how much I'm missing, then you can go and check the rest of it. The reason I tell you this is not because we get paid from Instagram, not that I know of anyway. Um, but the thing about Instagram is that we have posts on there of sometimes our daily lives, <laughs> making flutes or playing flutes or where we go, who we've met, what we do and all those kind of things as well. So um, Instagram is a really great option uh, if you guys wanna see what the flute making world looks like, not only behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, the scenes themselves, and part of this video has been captured in its integrity and posted um, as a picture on Instagram so you guys can see what's happening and find out about things you may not have known about. Anyway, long plug for my Instagram, which I don't get paid for. <laughs> so uh, anyway, today I wanted to share with you some of the flutes that I have in my collection. Oftentimes people ask me, what kind of flutes do you have in your collection? Well, I've only got a handful of flutes that other people have made. All of them, all of them have been gifts, uh, except for two that I've purchased. Well, I take that back. I own a silver flute that I bought. I have a maple fife that I bought. I have a flute from you know, lots of whistles and flutes from Mexico, some from Costa Rica. I've got one from like uh, Argentina or somewhere. I've got flutes from all over the place. But as far as Native American flutes go, um, the only ones that I have other than maybe a pan flute that I bought from some friends 30 years ago is uh, some that I have bought for demonstration. An example, uh, the, let's see, imported models. I'm trying to look for a politically correct way to say that. The imported flutes that I have made videos about in the past. Anyway, so all that aside, I wanted to share some of my own personal flutes with you. And I think it's probably pertinent to start off by showing you some of the ones that we've made in videos. My little pallet flute here, made out of some beautiful red oak. Here recently I've got a, uh, a uh, I guess a comment on the pallet flute video and they said, you know, uh, hardware stores sell red oak. And I'm like, you know, it's fine, but the point of the matter is I made it out of a pallet. It's not really the red oak that it was made out of as much as it was the pallet, which is kind of cool. Um, and pallets do offer a number of really amazing woods. Most importantly, wasted hardwoods that, you know, were made for holding a, a billet aluminum engine down or something like that nature. Something that's really hard and, and heavy that they needed something made out of equally hard and heavy wood. So uh, this is uh, just a piece of red oak if that's all you want to call it, but it was a pallet a little while back. Sounds really cool. So beautiful music coming out of a out of a pallet, which to me is amazing. And I don't know if any of you have seen the video, but it's still got a little nail right here stuck in it from when we made it, and it's been turned and it's kind of shiny. I don't think you can see it too well. I may have made a better presentation of it on the pallet flute video, but uh, really great uh, great flute in my opinion made out of something unusual. One of my other favorites too from a demonstration, which I'm not gonna play because this guy here has been around and has seen some, certainly seen some stuff in his life. But this is a branch flute that I made in a branch flute making video. Where I just basically showed you the techniques that you can use, a number of different techniques actually, that you can make a branch flute. Most everybody feels like, oh, branches, they're everywhere, I can do that. But let me tell you, this is one of the hardest, most difficult flutes to, to try to put together, in my opinion. Uh, of course, one of my other favorite ones was made out of a piece of uh, scavenged wood, wood that had some rot on it. And I don't know if you guys remember this or not, and you might be able to see it if I focus a light on it just right, but you can see some of that blue showing through there where it's translucent. Just an incredibly cool, cool process of making this flute. And we've actually got some other videos of making flutes like this coming up here very, very soon, which will be great. Uh, but this one was a lot of fun. My first time making a mixture of resin and wood flute, and uh, I'm incredibly pleased with the outcome. Um, let's see, one of my other favorites made a flute out of a cutting board, which this guy here has just set in my collection. 
kind of a reminder of you know so many different things that you can make flutes out of really the list is endless um, made one of these for a friend of mine and uh, he he seemed to like it quite a bit as well it's uh, bamboo actually so it's a bamboo cutting board and the design of the cutting board a lot of the really incredible looking flute in my opinion and it doesn't sound too bad I, I haven't played this before I picked it up probably a no no should always play your flutes before you go on a video just in case a dirt dauber clogged up in there or something happened and it's you know just not playing today or needs to be oiled or whatever the case really a beautiful flute and it was a lot of fun making that one as well now this one is one that I've played a lot and if you watched some of my videos that we made just like a music video just a little bit before this one um, you got to see me playing this a paper flute I mean it's just incredible that you can make such beautiful music on a cardboard or paper tube this one is so incredibly thin it definitely constitutes as paper and he's got a little like a origami crane up there to to help uh, accent him but uh, a piece of cardboard one of my very close friends um, that talks to me all the time about flute making has started making cardboard flutes on a regular basis and given them to everybody knows and he said that they're always so astounded at how beautiful this uh, uh, sounds on a piece of cardboard and of course was in a video we made Christmas of 2016 I believe uh, we had a video you got to watch me make the flute at the end I uh, got to hear me play uh, some Christmas songs on it and just really really incredible I love that guy I do pick it up and play it actually pretty often uh, and, and having said that of course you're always worried about well what if it gets too moist or too wet it's cardboard you know um, there was a video that we had begun and didn't complete for whatever reason where I actually made a flute just like this in the kitchen and I coated it in Mod Podge and if you don't know what Mod Podge is it's like a really light lightweight glue um, but it's also used for crafts and making all kinds of crazy stuff, paper mache and you know, whatever. But uh, I coated in that and I sanded it and I coated it again and it actually looks pretty sweet for something that doesn't have harsh lacquers on it, that doesn't have um, whatever. And I think it'll probably last a while, although I've had this one for going on five years. So uh, that having been said, a lot of my other favorite flutes that I have are just random Western Cedar flutes. And I say random, but they're all in every key that we make from bottom to top. And I've used these for recording countless times because, um, you know, I have a lot of them on hand for one thing, but also they produce a very good clear tone that I like to use for recording. And I have one in every key from this to that and they're really just amazing and uh, going up the line from there here's a that was a high B this is an A I've even done some experimentation on them <laughs> you would think to try to see if I could mess them up it really was making them better and um, some things that I haven't shared with everybody and maybe one day I will but uh, some tricks and techniques that uh, that we not only continually employ today but ones that I haven't and probably won't use on flutes in the future, uh, not for making and selling or what have you, only on experimental models. But, uh, but anyway, this is a F sharp here. Just another Western Cedar flute, you know, nothing special. <laughs> and my E, which you guys heard on our music video, I played this one a lot on the Pied Piper, which is kind of an interesting music video. At the time, my kids were in theater, and of course, being the parents of theater kids, I think that, that all goes together, um, we knew a lot of people in theater, both older and younger and everything, and we had like 30 some odd actors from theater in this video, which I'm really proud of. Um, turned out really great. First time I ever paid someone else to write a song for me that I played. Um, and uh, it turned out great. I was very, very pleased with it. It's something to see. Uh, one day we will be doing something like that again. Probably very soon. So. G version
version, which I didn't play uh, before the F sharp there, is actually sitting over on my, uh, my desk on the other end of our music room here. Uh, I don't need it right now, but uh, I'll tell you this, that I um, have been using it on our online classes that I teach on Zoom on how to play Native American flute. You can see those online classes available if they are still available at the time that you see this video, which chances are they will be, um, on my website under online classes. We do have upcoming classes. We have uh, on specific things, advanced class and a flute making class and a couple of different things there. But we have these regular online uh, classes, classes for beginners, which starts at one place and goes to another, it runs for three months. They have like a monthly price that you pay and it runs from the beginning to the end. Um, and you can join in at any time, which is a cool thing because it's on a cyclical, which is a real Native American idea of everything being on a cyclical time frame. Um, but if you join in on lesson number three, for example, you'll go all the way around lesson number 12, then you'll start back on lesson number one, lesson number two, lesson number three. Most people believe that you need to begin something at one place and end it at another place with a cyclical idea and mindset and concept and kind of Native American way of doing things. Um, you can actually join in at any time, get everything you need from start to finish from any of those classes on how to play the flute, and then we focus on um, a specific technique in each one of the classes. So pretty incredible, something fun. That is a plug, by the way. <laughs> how to play the blues on the flute in the class and everything. It is really something else. Uh, this is a key of D, which no collection of flutes. Uh, I think I probably have a number of key of D flutes laying around, uh, both high D and low D, and any, even an ultra high D that I've made for another kind of you know prototype flute that you guys may have seen in a Instagram video way back in the day. But uh, that having been said, one of my favorite flutes that I own is my first fifth drum that I ever made. My new fifth drums uh, are kind of curved here, which makes them look a little bit better. They're made out of the same exact wood, but this one's dark, not only because I've been touching it for a long time, you know, and your hands actually cause the wood to darken. Um, but uh, in addition to that, it was made out of a slightly darker piece of Western cedar, which is all of our flutes are made out of Western cedar, uh, the drums like this anyway. <laughs> an incredible instrument. I could sit and play this thing all day long. Um, so another one of my absolute favorites. And then this is kind of a silly one. You know, there was a time when, you know, if you guys are watching this 20 years in the future, that Pokemon not only was around, but it spawned a video game, Pokemon Go, and everybody was playing it for about six months. And uh, anyway, uh, during the beginning stages of Pokemon Go, I thought, you know, we should make a Poke flute, and, and I did. And then, of course, many of my kids' friends had to have one, so we've made a couple extra uh, that have gone out. I don't make them for sale. It just consists of a little wooden ball shaped like a Pokeball, pushed on the end of a Western Cedar flute here with a little Pokemon figure up at the top. I think we've made a Snorlax one, and I want to say we made one of the other big, uh, big Pokemon-type characters, and then uh, old Pikachu here. Uh, <laughs> I have to sound like a boomer, right? Pikachu. Um, but anyway, yeah, really great, great flute, good sounding flute. Still has my mark on the back of it, like most of our flutes do today. Uh, this is a bear, by the way. A lot of people try to think if it was an M or it was a this or that, but to me, it's clearly a bear with a tattoo of a rose on his back. So, uh, really important part of my history and that guy right there. And that having been said, uh, before I show you my oldest flutes and conclude this video, I will tell you that I looked at this and I thought, you know, this is just too many flutes to be shown on a video, and I've got so many, so many flutes. I mean, just, I look at, I keep looking over at my desk and there's a two, three shelves on top of it holding flutes, including my first flute I ever made, which I got back after my mom had passed on. Um, I got uh, that flute and uh, it sits up there kind of hiding on top of a flute stand that one of my friends and customer, previous customers, current friends uh, made for us. And uh, just, you know, it's kind of ironic and iconic sitting there all by himself. But uh, I've got one that I've never shown in a video, which is a type of kenna, 
Um, it was one of the first kennas, I think I should say, that I've ever made, or rather inblown flute. It is frightening sounding. It sounds beautiful, perfectly in tune. Did not use a tuner, you know, but frightening in the fact that when I play it, it, it seems like it's leading towards the end of the world or something. So I don't play it that often, but I, I do like it a lot. It's a beautiful flute, very incredibly low toned, has a massive rim blown mouthpiece that you have to push up against your chin. It's made to fit my, my face, has a massive mouthpiece. It's the largest mouthpiece of any flute that I own or any that I've seen. Um, but this guy here, uh, this pair, these twins, um, represent a video that I made on making an original six hole flute. We used a pattern that is from a book called The Ben Hunt Guide to Arts and Crafts, which was written about from today's standpoint around 100, 115 years ago or 20 years ago, something like that. Uh, I don't even know what today is, but, but anyway, uh, so a lot of flute makers got their starts from learning how to make flutes from the last two pages of that book, which was a book on Indian arts and crafts and how to make a drum and how to make a fish basket, and how to tan a deer hide, how to do this, how to do that, and all this down the road. A lot of flute makers learn how to make Native American flutes from the last two pages of that book. Um, it's a Boy Scout manual. It's a five by seven, uh, about uh, 90 pages maybe. I don't even remember from the last time I looked at it. Um, but uh, anyway, long story short, the back of the book has information on how to make uh, this kind of flute and this kind of flute, which are both identical. Um, and by the way, that's another thing I should tell you right off. Six hole flutes doesn't mean it's, you know, Plains Indian style and five hole flutes doesn't mean it's Eastern Woodland. People of all different cultures made all different kinds of flutes. We all started off years and years ago, blown on something. Uh, it made a cool sound. We thought, let's make another one. So they probably made the first one after that. No hole one was a two hole flute. And then after that, they made one, I think probably a three just to see what happens. I know the Choctaws talk about their three hole flutes all the time. I'd have to see historical references to really get a good grasp of it. But the four hole flutes, they're all over the place. Uh, people in Central America, South America, Alaska, Mongolia, Japan, any place that what I consider to be like a Polynesian family group or people that we might be related to, not necessarily from us coming across the Bering Strait, which is, whew, don't even think about that mess. Uh, but a lot of people made four hole flutes. Now, people in European cultures made four hole flutes. We all traded everything for a long time. And, communicated and stuff and things that you just don't know about. But having said that, the four hole flutes kind of predate most everything in the Americas. And if I cover this thing, this flute here specifically, if I cover these top two holes up here, it is actually four hole flute and plays perfectly. So my theory is that about 5,000 or no, 4,000 years ago when we were not um, hunting for our food as much as we started growing it, we lived in bigger communities and, and this kind of thing. You see giant communities of people, the, the precursor to the uh, Mississippian cultures were really flourishing and coming up and, and being more visible, I guess, to modern archeologists. I think that's probably, I think I cover all my bases. Um, anyway, that's when you see that somebody probably in central United States said, hey, what happens if I drill an extra hole? And then they said probably about the same time, because I mean, I, I'm a flute maker. If I've made two or three flutes, in my life and it took me hours to make them and I consider myself to be a flute maker, put myself in the mindset and the shoes of these people five to 4,000 years ago, I think to myself, you know, I'm gonna make another one, let's see what happens. And so let's drill another hole. And they did that and they made flutes with up to like 18 holes or whatever. Um, and uh, there were a couple that we settled on over the years, four hole flutes, five hole flutes and six hole flutes. All of us made each of those, all native, and I say us, native peoples in the Americas made each of those kinds of flutes. So the reason these are special is because it proves a point of mine that there is a small piece of data that is a miss in the Bent Hunt Guide to Indian Arts and Crafts, which spawned most of the flute makers that anybody watching this video and including myself have ever met or seen or heard about. That book led so many people on how to make their first flute down their journey. Um, Having said that, um, citing a really quick little historical reference, my high school um, history teacher told us about a time that uh, back in the late 18, early 1900s, that um, some people were commissioned to make rulers because they were trying to teach kids how to use a ruler uh, at that time. And so people started making wooden rulers. And one guy realized that he had so many boards coming from this place he ordered his wood from 
that were just long enough, if he made the rulers about 10 inches instead of 12, that it would make a great item. And then of course he couldn't sell them a ruler that was only 10 inches, so he graduated out to 12 inches. There's a possibility that Ben Hunt used one of those rulers to make his flute. However, what I believe is, because it's kind of obvious to a flute maker or woodworker or anybody that's tried this, um, I believe that what he said in his book was the inside diameter should actually be the outside diameter. If you notice these two kind of kind of match. Uh, historically, a lot of our original flutes were a lot skinnier, not bigger, you know, and the, even the bigger ones had small holes inside of them, a small inside bore. And uh, likewise, that's why you find a lot of modern six hole flutes today. Matter of fact, most of them, except for the few that I have offered over the years. That you have to keep your finger covering that hole all the time. What self-respecting people in the world would do that? Why would a race of people who have been stereotyped for not wasting a single piece of buffalo, why would they drill a hole and not ever use it? Do you know how long it takes to drill a hole by hand? Try it. This one, on the other hand, plays a little differently. You don't have to keep your finger covering that hole all the time. And it plays great. So that having been said, uh, let's see. A little treat here. I don't know how many times I've showed y'all this, but this was one of my first flutes I ever played. A friend of mine, that my cousin actually, a uh, distant cousin, distant distant cousin, uh, had helped me learn how to make flutes. My first one, and he gave this to me as a gift for trying so hard to make my first flute, which was cool. Uh, made out of a piece of tulip poplar, so it weighs. The only weight on it is this piece of red cedar here. Other ways, otherwise, it weighs about. Gosh, that's a tongue twister. About an ounce. Uh, so it's incredibly light. And Tulip Poplar is so well known for doing this, I didn't realize at the time, but I'd set it on my TV when I was a kid, had one of those big console TVs, and it sat up there and got so hot from the heat coming off the TV that it warped like a banana. So I went out there and I turned it around the other way, and about three or four days later, it went back straight, and I took it off the TV and never did that again. Kind of a neat flute, uh, big bore on the inside of it. He wanted to make something deep sounding. Uh, this, uh, and I said tulip poplar, but this is actually, do you remember what kind of poplar this is? It's not tulip poplar. Shoot, hold on just a minute. I gotta think, time to cut out the video here. No, um, anyway, this is a piece of really neat, neat wood. It's a uh, very lightweight and, oh, Tupelo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My camera person says Tupelo, it is Tupelo. Um, and Tupelo wood is what a lot of duck carvers that make decoy ducks use because it floats, it's so light. Um, but there's two parts of the Tupelo tree, same Tupelo honey comes from, uh, but the Tupelo tree uh, will have a brown inner core, which is hard as a rock, and this light, corky outer part, which can be most of the tree, some of the tree, and sometimes barely any of the tree. Um, this comes from somebody who did a lot of work with that as a kid. Uh, but, uh, but this piece is really light, really great. Um, this one here is the second to last one I'm going to share with you today. This is a copy of an original Cherokee River Cane flute down to the shape, size, dimensions, fingerings, placements, not the block is a is kind of my own special duck decoy if you would, kind of a simple simple one. And it looks really old. I know it does. It's only like 30, 32 I think. It has cracked several times here. I've sealed it, I've wrapped it, I've done so many different things with it. Um, I put the holes in the same place they were originally and then I find out that if I slide this piece of leather over them just a little bit, it makes it a little better on spot on on tune. And it has a tiny round sound hole here. You know, don't knock it until you try it, but. Uh, that I would love to sit and play and have made so many copies of. As a matter of fact, most of our five hole flutes uh, are related to this one, I should say. Their fingering patterns and everything has somewhat come from them. Uh, and then this one, finally, the one that everybody thinks, oh, it's so great, so great, because it's got these spirals. That's what makes it play good, right? <laughs> it sounds just like my other D I played a moment ago. Um, so uh, this flute is close to D. It's actually like a, 
E flat flat a little bit or maybe a D sharp or a D sharp a little bit. Um, but it's a really great flute made out of a piece of 2000 year old Western cedar. A friend of mine who's a park ranger from Washington state gave it to the wood to us and I made a number of flutes out of it and then I quit making flutes out of it and, and uh, just really love it. Kind of a neat shape, neat design. It's a really good sounding flute that everybody just fell in love with and has probably helped launch many of our videos today. Having said that, of course, over the time, um, I have switched up and uh, believe it or not, some of our videos have this Western Cedar F sharp in them and I just play the just play the same tune on it and uh, it uh, turns out pretty pretty good. Most people don't even realize I'm playing a different flute. So anyway, long-winded I know. Hopefully that uh, I've shared some of these with you. If you haven't seen the videos I came from, might be a good idea to go back and check. Or if you thought, you know, I want to make a flute out of something weird that's in the kitchen. Uh, three, three of them, I think, were made out of stuff out of the kitchen in here. Uh, not including the palette that maybe some kitchen tiles came in on. But uh, anyway, I hope that this video has found you all well. Don't forget to check out our website for more updates on things we have going on. Of course, our flute classes, which have been a great success and have been a lot of fun for me. And um, also, uh, all the upcoming things that we have going on too. So I hope that you are all doing very well in these times that we have today in our world. I hope you're enjoying life, which is to me what life is all about. Uh, that and family and racing cars. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, don't, don't race cars. Uh, but if you do, be careful. Make sure you wear your seatbelt and you know whatever else you need to have. And don't do it on the street. And boy, I opened a can of worms today. Anyway, uh, you guys take care. Happy flute making, happy flute playing. Once again, Charlie Montatuyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. See you soon.